Would you please stand, uh, stay standing for the reading from James, chapter 4, beginning at verse 13, and then concluding at verse 5, chapter 5, verse 6. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. <clears throat> what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Uh, please be seated. So I said from the very beginning of James that I believe that James is written with the people in mind. And what I mean by that is, is that most people will comment on just how superior James's Greek is, and then say, as they read the letter of James in Greek, how it is so disjointed. How can anybody make sense of the structure of James? And the point that I was making is that it makes perfect sense when you begin to realize that his letter is following the pattern of people's lives. And as you look at people's lives within the church, you begin to realize that they are very disjointed and there are very few connections that make any sense. And so James's letter is beautiful in that it is a reflection of the people that he is speaking to. And what he is showing us is that as he speaks, he has a deep and wide understanding of the issues, but not just the issues at the surface level or the applicable level in terms of how they are applied, but rather at the root. And so this passage, which seems to concentrate on wealth, is not actually about wealth. And this passage, which seems to concentrate on fraudulent dealings, is sort of the fruit of the root. And the root... Uh, here in James is the sin of presumption. And that sin causes these bad practices within the church. And so James is just has a very beautiful way of being able to address people directly. And he's not too concerned whether or not he has strung a letter together that is beautifully written from beginning to end, because his overall concern is to make the right point to the right people at the right time so that they actually begin to follow the Lord as they should. If you read Romans, however, you begin to understand there's a clear difference, that Paul is clearly writing a letter from beginning to end, where the clarity of his argument for the gospel is clear. It's very structured, very ordered, very logical, and again, beautiful in and of its context. But James doesn't write like that, because James seems to be addressing specific people at a specific time. And so James has both clear explanations and clear applications. Notice then what James does as we look at this as a summary. James calls his people in verse chapter 4, verse 13, and chapter 5, verse 1, with the instruction to come now, that is to pay attention, to listen closely, pay with close attention to the words that I'm about to see, say. 
and then consider your ways in light of the words that I have spoken. Or to put it a different way, now is the time for self-reflection. Now is the time to go back to the mirror, the mirror of God's law, and take a good, long, hard look at yourself because you are not doing this. And because you are not doing this, you are not seeing yourself in the proper light. You're not seeing yourself as God sees you. You are seeing yourself as you see you. And therefore, you're ending up with a false interpretation of where your life stands in relationship to others, and most importantly, where your life stands in relationship to God. Now, one of the greatest comforts in this passage is actually one of the greatest discomforts for the people that he is speaking to. The greatest comfort is that if the Lord wills, that whatever is, is the will of God. That is a wonderful comfort. But it is a terrible frustration to those people who want to do what they will. And so it is understood in one way to those who follow Christ and are pursuing holiness and righteousness. But the will of God can come across as a very negative statement to those who don't like it. In other words, I've had plenty of pastoral situations where a person has laid out to me at length everything they plan to do in the next 10 years of their life. And I finish what they are saying by, with the statement, if the Lord wills. And all of a sudden, you see every emotion in their body drop to the floor. It's as if I have popped the balloon. But all that I have stated is the will of God. All that I have stated is if the Lord wills. And what is happening is that these people are beginning to live a presumptuous life where they are planning this, that, and the other. And by those few and gentle words, if the Lord wills, to the right person who lives in the will of God, it is a great assurance. But to a person who is planning their own way of life in their own time, it is a negative statement. And so every time you speak to people who seem to be boasting their way through about what they will do, just add the sentence, if the Lord wills. And it is the most wonderful correction to the heart that is going astray. Because it really is according to what the Lord wills as what we will do next. The main question that James has here is this. What are you doing with your life? I don't ask what are you doing tomorrow or what are you doing next month. You're allowed to plan. You're allowed to plan how. But what are you actually doing with the life that God has given you to live? Not what you do for yourself, but what do you do with it in relationship to the fact that you are now a servant of the Most High God? That you are now to live in accordance with His will, serving Him in the beauty of fellowship with other people. What are you doing with your life? This is at the very heart of James's question. Are you planning ahead as if God has no influence over your plans? Are you planning ahead as though God is not bothered about the decisions you are making? This is at the heart of what James is getting at, the sin of presumption. The point here in verse 15 of chapter 4 is that nothing escapes the Lord's attention. Nothing ever escapes the, Lord atten the Lord's attention. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're doing. He knows what you're about to think. And he knows what you're about to do. And therefore, the Lord is always ahead of you in guiding and protecting you. But he's always ahead of you in terms of the correction that he'll put in your path in order to bring you back to the place where you ought to be. And therefore, we are to understand everything that we have received comes from the Lord. All the riches and all the beauty and all the wealth and all the glory, anything that comes down to us, every good gift is from above. And therefore, live your life in the reflection of what do you have that you did not receive. What do you have in your life that has not been given to you as a gracious and merciful gift from the hand of your God? And as you consider this, 
then suddenly your life begins to take the shape that it ought to take. If not, then your heart is not being filled with the love of God. It is not considering the mercies of God. And life then becomes quite presumptuous. It then becomes something that you think you are owed. It then becomes something that you think it is yours to then divvy up into whatever segments you want in order to do whatever you want the next day. Your life is a mercy extended to you every single morning. When you wake up, you ought to say, thank you, God, for mercies new. This is a mercy that I have woken up this morning. That is a mercy that I'm able physically to get out of bed and work and walk and serve. Nothing then is taken for granted as we live before God. Or to put it in the words of Jesus, are not two sparrows sold for a penny and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. We tend to think that ah, God only is concerned with the big things. No, not even a sparrow can fall to the ground apart from the will of the Father. Everything is carefully and graciously cared for by the Lord who wills. And so the issue here is not the wealth, it's not the planning, it is rather the sin of presumption. It is the sin that I can make decisions that can bring about certain ends irrespective of anything that God does or even, if you are that arrogant, over and against what God has actually willed. Calvin once said that no Christian should ever expect a blessing contrary to the way, to the revelation of God's word. You should never expect God to bless you in ways for your own ends. That's not how God works. And so we live a life that is dependent on God whether we realize it or not. And therefore, independent living is presumptuous living. Independent living is a life that doesn't consider the mercies that you have received this morning. An independent life is a life where you think the future will actually be according to what you will. And even when it isn't, you keep trying. And it, it is that keep trying that keeps you off track. Because you are constantly trying to, to fulfill your own will rather than live in humble dependence on the will of God who wills whatever comes to pass. And so the problem of presumption is almost identical to the problem with anxiety. Because the reason people are anxious in the Sermon on the Mount is because they are worried about tomorrow which they have no control over. And that worry then dictates the choices in the decisions that they make. And decisions means that they then live a certain type of life that has certain commitments that are different than what they ought to be. So then you begin to see how life spirals out of control because the underlying issue in anxiety is exactly the same as it is in presumption. You're not living your life as if the Lord is in control. And so the anxious person and the presumptuous person are committing the same sin. They're different results, of course, but it's the same sin. It's the sin of not appreciating that everything is according to the will of your Lord. And this is the very heart of what James is saying. Wealth, as in the Sermon on the Mount, as here in James, has the capacity to blind your eyes as to what you do to others. Wealth has the capacity to blind you to the needs of others, but it also has the, 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 the effect of causing you to turn a blind eye to things that could actually affect your bottom line. That's what wealth can actually uh, do. do. And so God is showing us through his word here and through James that the root of the issue of anxiety and worrying about the future and even trying to plan for it is a lack of understanding and belief and conviction that God is willing all things to come to pass. Here in James, the sin of presumption is exactly the same. At the very root of it is you are just not believing that whatever you are dealing with in life, you're always dealing with God. You think you're not. But you really are, and you're dealing with God's will. And so chapter 5, 
we have the same again, come now, you rich. Again, further reflection, perhaps to a different group of people, perhaps to many different people. And the question is, is why aren't people convinced of the shortness of life when everything in the world should convince them that life is short and that things perish? I mean, think about it. You buy something brand new, it's only a matter of time before it gets old. Why doesn't that convince you that to put any storage in material things is to put storage in that which rots away? Or that when you look at people and you begin to realize that I've known this person for 20 years and they don't look like what they did 20 years ago, you're getting old. Now, of course, you still love them, okay? Because your love is not based on how they look, is it? It is based on what you are to do for them in relationship with God. And so now we begin to see that we have everything surrounding us telling us that everything gets old, everything rots, everything decays, and yet we're still not convinced. And perhaps one of the reasons that we accumulate more is perhaps because we think that we can perpetuate life in such a way because there is no end, but there really is. And that end is the judgment of God. And so James draws our attention to this, firstly, by saying that our life is a mist, and then secondly, by pointing out that all the material things that we gather just rot and decay. Our life is as short, if not shorter, than many of the things that we actually own. In fact, your house that you live in will probably outlive you. Your life is shorter than the home you live in. Your life is shorter than the business you have. Your life is shorter than the qualifications you have. Your life is shorter than almost all of these things. But for some reason, we just are not convinced because we tend to think that I have time to pursue life my way before God has his way. No, no, no. God is always having his way. And so your life can either go smoothly within the will of God or it can be a life of constant frustration as you struggle to accept the will of God in your daily life. And so the issue here is not wealth. The issue here is not even the accumulation of things. The issue here is not really even making profit. Rather, the issue is presumption, which then leads to all of these other problems like defrauding people and like storing wealth. They're not the issues. They're the consequence of the sin of presumption. And so this is a sin that every single one of us are guilty of committing. Nothing wrong with planning. But how many of us go ahead without ever thinking that this is according to what the Lord wills? I think we all do it at different times for different reasons. And so how do we protect ourselves from this sin? Well, namely, by understanding that everything is, as they used to put it, the old English letters, Dio Valente, God willing. Everything is according to God's will. So I have three considerations for you this morning. The first is this. Now is the time for self-reflection. If you struggle with the sin of presumption, it is time to spend time in self-examination. Self-reflection in the mirror of God's word. Secondly, you have to understand the word now. Children find this word very difficult to understand. Adults also find it difficult to understand, possibly because they found it difficult to understand as a child, and it was therefore never corrected, and they still find it difficult now. now. And then thirdly, is not omitting what you know from how you live which is the very sin of presumption. The sin of presumption is admitting what you know from how you live. I'll read James's word. So whoever knows the right thing to do, that is to live life in the will of God and not do it, for him it is a sin. What's the sin? Presumption. Because the right thing to do is to live in humble dependence on God. It is to live life according to the will of God. It is to live life knowing that everything is subject to the will of God. 
And therefore, when you live life in a way which doesn't pay any attention to that, you're omitting from your life what you know, therefore committing the sin by omission. The sin of presumption is the sin of omission. This is what James states. So self-reflection. Self-reflection is best undertaken when your life is experiencing extreme pressure. It's best undertaken when all your powers of observation and all your powers of skills are being tested, like driving in Minnesota. I can remember driving into Minneapolis thinking, I don't think my sanctification is high enough to meet the man who designed these roads. And then I began to realize as I'm driving, how am I supposed to pay attention to five lanes of traffic and roads coming on joining the road that I'm leaving to get off the road. How does that even make sense? And now I'm beginning to realize that not only do I not have the power within me to take all of this information in, but what if all of a sudden my eyes failed or my muscles failed? And now I'm traveling along the road at 55 miles an hour and I'm dependent on so many things that I'm not even paying attention to. But all of a sudden, in the moment of pressure, all of these realities come to bear on your life, that suddenly I am a weak individual dependent on so many things that I cannot control. And if they went, it would be the end of my life. Every morning I wake up, I realize that God has woken me up. Every time I walk, I thank God that my legs work. Every time I go to sleep, Every time I go to the bathroom, every time I go outside, every time I drive the car, suddenly you begin to realize as you think about these things in self-reflection that all these things that you take for granted are according to what the Lord wills. All of them are according to what the Lord wills. And how often do we not pay a single bit of attention to them? This is where self-reflection starts. It starts with when you're under pressure the most your weaknesses come to the forefront. And then you begin to see yourself in light of who you really are, a person highly dependent on the Lord who wills. To hold all these things together, as it says in Colossians, that in Christ, all things are held together. Every single part of my body is held together so that I can drive the car carefully so that I can park it carefully, so that I can walk out of the car into the house. All of this is held together by the Lord who wills. And just think how easy it is now not to pay any attention to that and just to carry on every single day of my life not giving a single bit of attention to the Lord who wills. Because now we think it's just the big things. Well, I think driving or sleeping or walking or eating are big things because there are many people who can't do it. And it's the Lord who wills. And so self-reflection, when done properly, allows us to see that there is almost nothing that we can do in and of ourselves unless the Lord wills. Because it is Christ who holds all things together. And this is where we come to the true wisdom, the true beauty of self-reflection. We are drawn ever closer to Christ who wills all things to come to pass. We cannot help but arrive at Christ as we self-reflect. It seems counterintuitive that the more I think about myself, the more I will think about Christ. But that is exactly how it works. Because when you truly consider yourself, you cannot help but think and are led to the Christ who holds all things together. That's the purpose of self reflection. And so let us consider this as well, that Calvin said that true wisdom, that is true, clear, pure wisdom, is not only a knowledge of God, but a knowledge of self. That you know yourself well when you know God and you know yourself in light of God. So James says, what is your life? Reflect. What is your life but a mist? Reflect on your life. And so when he is addressing these people who are making plans to do this, that, and the other, he's causing them to reflect on whether or not their life will actually be there to do any of those things. 
Rather, understand that daily mercy is extended to you daily in order for you to do the things that you have planned to do. Nothing wrong with planning. It's just the presumption that you can be there without the Lord. It's just the presumption that you can do it in the strength of your own will rather than dependence on God's will. The sin is not the planning. The sin is the presumption. The sin is not the wealth. The sin is the presumption. And therefore, if you admit from your life that, that the Lord wills, you are therefore committing sin by omission, the sin of presumption. Secondly, now. Now is misunderstood by children and also misunderstood by parents. Let me put it this way. When a child says to their parent, can I have or can I go or can I do or can I, can I, can I, and the parent says, no, not now, does it make any sense to a child? Because you know what's going to come next. Do you mean like not now, like not right now? Or do you mean like not now as in not before supper? Or do you mean not now as in not before bedtime? Or not now as in not today? Or not now as in not tomorrow? Or not, right? Now, a child who thinks like this is thinking wisely. The parent who doesn't understand is misunderstanding just how clever their child is. Because now becomes very difficult to understand. Now, what's the problem? Now, when a child grows up with the not now and not knowing what the not now means, they live life before God, constantly pushing against the will of God. So they try this and they try that. And the Lord's will directs them in a completely different direction as if to say, not now. And because they don't know how to handle the not now, they consider doing their own thing all over again, only for the will of God to stop them for a second time. But instead of them drawing a conclusion that the Lord may not be leading them that way, they just go, not now, maybe later. And so they keep pursuing life their own way because they've never learned that not now is no, not now because it's not good for you, or not now at all, or not now because I'm leading you a different way. And so one of the reasons why Christians get frustrated with the will of God is because they are constantly waiting for the will of God to match their will. They're constantly living life to, I'm going to do this, and every time they get frustration, they just say, it's okay, the Lord didn't will it for me today, but maybe tomorrow because it's not now, and maybe next week. And so they continue in their folly, and they continue in this chop and change, this back and forth, like the double-minded man in James 1, where they are driven and tossed because they haven't quite got used to the slow direction of how the Lord leads. And so they are constantly coming before the Lord, frustrated with the will of God, but thinking, well, it's just not now, but maybe tomorrow. And all that they are doing is that they are living life, waiting, earnestly waiting with huge amount of hope for the will of God to line up with their will. And therefore making the fundamental mistake that it ought to be the other way around. That it is your will that is to come into line with the will of God. And so the reason it doesn't is because they take the Lord's will is not now, but they don't know what that means. Well, not today. Well, I'll try again tomorrow. Not this year. Well, I'll try again next year. And so money is wasted. Time is wasted. Effort is wasted. And why is it wasted? Because they're constantly waiting for the will of the Lord to match their will. Instead of learning that true wisdom is your will coming in line with the will of God. Make sense? So now you begin to understand that the sin of presumption is a lot deeper and more complicated than you first thought. Because the way people handle the will of God is that they try and line it up the wrong way. They're lining God's will up with their own rather than their will with the will of God. Hence, the problem with now. And so people persist in the wrong way because they have not uh, considered the Lord's will properly. In fact, they may not even be considering the Lord's will at all. They have nothing more than misguided hope. And so thirdly, all of this is committing the sin of omission. Leaving out what you know to do what you want. 
leaving out what you know to do what you want. And so omitting, omitting from your life what you know to be true, that whatever in life is according to the will of God, and then omitting that from your life is the sin of omission, which then leads you to pursue your own will regardless of anything that the Word of God teaches. This is the very heart of what James is saying, because it makes a real difference to how I live. The first difference is this, that a life that is not planned in the knowledge of God is a life that will bound to be shaped by self-indulgence. A life that is not planned in line with the will of God, or at least consideration of what the Lord might be doing in my life, is a life that cannot help but go down the path of self-indulgence. I will do this, I will do that, I will pursue this, I will pursue that. And so they consider their life with God as a chopping change, but all that's happened is they are being drifted in, back and forth, tossed over in James 1. Rather than understanding that the way God normally leads a purpose, a person, is through this slow, persistent, and consistent direction. God never takes us on too many dead ends or sharp corners. Most of the time, it's a slow progression through life where God is leading us. Secondly, um, we ought to recognize that living life according to your own plans is evidence in your judgment. And this is what James says here, that your wealth is nothing more than evidence against you. That the way you've treated these laborers and not paid for them, that is nothing more than evidence against you in the future judgment. We don't think, well, that was then, this is now. No, everything in life is evidence to who we are. Either it brings glory to Christ, or it is evidence against our own sinfulness before God. And this is the very thing that James states here. Let me just read. Behold, the wages of the laborers, this is chapter 5, verse 4, of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And cr the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Evidence against you. You think you've got away with it, but it's evidence against who you are. And therefore, when you don't consider life according to God's will, not only do you live a life of self-indulgence, or you potentially could live a life of self-indulgence, you are at least heading that way. More importantly, that life is evidence against you in the future judgment, a judgment that we cannot avoid. And so let me conclude with this. Throughout Scripture, all the way throughout scripture, it is clear that those who know more are judged more strictly. As I said in the call to confession, that Jesus says, greater is the sin in him who brought me to you. Why? Because Judas knew more than Pilate. And throughout scripture from beginning to end, it becomes abundantly clear that those who know more, by implication, face a higher penalty. And therefore the sin of omission is a terrible sin to commit. Even if this section of James isn't a correction for you this morning, it is at least a good reminder. Even if you are not guilty of committing the sin of presumption in the same way it's being committed here, you are at least reminded and instructed all over again not to commit it in the future, to not live your life as if God doesn't matter or as if God does not have any influence over today or tomorrow. Those who live in the will of God humbly accept the assurance that comes with the will of God. But those who are constantly waiting for the will of God to match theirs are constantly frustrated by the very thing that should assure them the most. And therefore, humble yourselves before God and do not commit the sin of presumption which is the sin of omission. Amen. Let me pray for us before we sing. Gracious God and Father, we thank you that as we come before you this morning, we recognize that everything is according to your will. And if we didn't, we have been reminded yet again from your word. Help us to understand. May these words enlighten our mind with a view 
of changing our heart. In Jesus' name, amen.